Good evening and welcome to the ANA Teletown Hall COVID-19 update. I'm Kate Jansky, president of the AANA. On behalf of myself and the ANA board of directors, I would like to thank you for your work that you are doing to help combat COVID-19 crisis, both in your role as a CRNA and in your role as a state leader. This is an unprecedented time and I am proud of all the work our members are doing to help address the healthcare crisis our nation is facing. In the past few weeks, you've seen a lot of communication from the ANA on recent developments at the state, federal, and national level related to COVID-19. I can assure you that the ANA board of directors and staff have been all hands on deck on this issue. We've been working diligently on all fronts, providing practice resources to address issues that our members are dealing with on the front lines of battling the COVID-19 outbreak, advocating for you in Congress, at the White House, and within the Veterans Administration, and providing support and advocacy resources at the state and local level. The goal of tonight's call is to discuss some of the most recent developments related to practice and advocacy. We're going to address some of the common questions and concerns we've been hearing from you, the members, things you are facing during these critical times. I will turn this over first to Dr. Randall Moore, CEO of the AANA, who will give an overview of the recent developments pertaining to the COVID-19 situation and how ANA is responding to the current environment. Randy, will you please start off by providing our members with an ANA update regarding COVID-19? Thank you, Kate. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with the members this evening. I want to start by uh, providing a high-level overview of, uh, of what's going on in this country, and then we're going to drill down a little bit more into how it's impacting our members and uh, uh, the resources that the AANA is working to, uh, to, to bring to bear in this crisis. So uh, as of about an hour ago, uh, there are a documented 242,000 cases of COVID-19. Uh, obviously, that number is vastly underestimating the actual number of patients who have either tested positive or, or, who, or who are walking around right now with the virus. Uh, as of this afternoon, unfortunately, there's been 6,000 fatalities since the beginning of this crisis. If you look at the modeling, and, and the modeling appears to be pretty consistent uh, and uh, pretty scary, uh, it, we're, we're estimating uh, that the peak of this crisis is going to be on or about April 16th, just a little bit too, just a little bit over two weeks from now. That is a, uh, the concern there obviously is that uh, at that time, th they are anticipating somewhere around 2000 to 2,500 fatalities a day. And that will be the peak strain on all of the resources uh, within the country. So when you look at this modeling, uh, a few things should, should jump out. One, while the average peak is predicted to be April 16th, it's in fact uh, earlier in New York City or New York State in New Jersey with a peak at, at or around April 9th. Uh, in Illinois, they're, pro they're projecting a peak on April 17th. In Washington, D.C., they're projecting a peak on April 16th. Now, if you look at the, the east and the west coast, particularly California, uh, they're, predict they're predicting a peak on April 28th with a peak in Florida on May 2nd. So that tells us a few things. One, uh, while the, the nationwide peak is predicted to be in two weeks, this is going to be peaking in different areas of the country at different times. Uh, if the projected fatality rate is scary, uh, in the last few days, the White House has openly been uh, discussing numbers between 100 and 250,000 fatalities by August 1st. If you look at some of the more conservative modeling, they're predicting somewhere around 91,000 fatalities between now and August 1st. And to put that in context, if you added up all of the fatalities in the Korean War, in the Vietnam War, that would be around 91,000. So it's a profound crisis of unprecedented proportions. So give you some better a perspective in terms of what we're doing here at the AANA. So on March 18th, I had the uh, ability to go to the White House. I met with President Trump, Vice President Pence, uh, Seema Verma, who's the CMS administrator and several other key administration officials. 
uh, I was with a nursing organizational uh, group of 11 other uh, large nursing organizations, and we had about an hour uh, with, with the president and his team. And that time we talked about several things that are particularly relevant and important to us. One is the inadequate supply of personal protective equipment. Two is the inadequate supply of ventilators, which appears to be uh, coming to a crisis in New York City where they're predicting they're gonna be out of ventilators in less than a week. And three, the aggressive removal of barriers through all federal agencies to ensure that all advanced practice providers, including CRNA, can contribute to this crisis. Uh, clearly, uh, they, they took our advice in, in, in many different ways. So just a couple of days ago, you likely know that CMS has removed the physician supervision requirement for nurse anesthetists on a temporary basis. And we think that's absolutely the right move. Uh, we are now advocating for that to be a permanent fix. Uh, we are continuing to work our congressional relationships in, in Washington, D.C., our relationships in the White House and in the agencies to remove all barriers for the full utilization of nurse anesthetists, including the VA. Uh, we are working very closely with our state leaders who are moving aggressively as well uh, in removing barriers. I, I won't go through all of the states, but several states uh, in the last week or so through executive action by the governors have removed barriers for the full utilization of nurse anesthetists and other providers. Uh, just uh, on last Friday, almost a week ago, President Trump signed the, corona, the, sorry, the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, also known as the CARE Act. And within that, there are some, some key elements that impact us directly and indirectly, uh, including over $350 billion on no interest loans, uh, Title VIII reauthorization, relief for student debt and student debt uh, loaner, uh, student debt and student debt follow, uh, borrowers, and over $100 billion goes to, are going to go to the hospitals and facilities. So we're now actively working on COVID-4, COVID Legislative Package, package 4. Uh, we don't know exactly when that's going to move, but we're already working with our congressional allies to secure wins for CRNAs, including potentially uh, financial protections through grant funding. We're also working with our APRN and uh, advanced practice provider community uh, to include other elements within this legislative package that will help uh, providers and remove barriers. So we've been very busy, as you know, on developing and putting out clinical resources. Uh, this is an unprecedented crisis. This is a novel virus. Uh, even today, the treatment regimen is not well understood. And so we've been working very closely with our subject matter experts within the profession to push out the best quality clinical guidance that we can. Uh, first, you'll know uh, that we worked in collaboration with the American Society of Anesthesiologists and the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation in creating a position statement around PPE, personal protective equipment, and anesthesia professionals. Uh, we also, uh, just a little bit over a week ago, put out our own position statement in which we said that nurse anesthetists and other healthcare workers who uh, are not given the proper PPE may bring their own into the facility. Uh, and I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud that the board moved on that. And clearly that was the right move uh, because now we're seeing other organizations adopt that position statement as well. We continue to work very, very diligently uh, in Washington, DC and with other stakeholders in ensuring that CRNAs have the adequate personal protective equipment and uh, we will continue to do that as well. Uh, we know because this is such a dynamic situation uh, that CRNAs are now being put in, in interesting positions that maybe they wouldn't have anticipated a few weeks ago, including on critical care teams serving as advanced practice registered nurses. If you go to the AANA website, you'll see all kinds of information about that, including the job description and position statements. It's our position that CRNAs are uniquely qualified to be involved and in, in the response to the situation. And so that's what we're advocating uh, with our, our colleagues in the anesthesia uh, in the community. So beyond that, uh, we continue to push out high quality critical care resources to our members. And we are continuing to evaluate this, this very fluid situation. We know that, as I mentioned earlier, I, we have a real concern about the availability of ventilators in this country. So we're working to understand what position statements, future position statements may be need, needed there and what we can do from an advocacy perspective to 
to ensure that the equipment hits the clinical environment so we can take care of our patients. Uh, we know that, unfortunately, because almost all elective surgeries in the country have been canceled or postponed, uh, there's a number of our colleagues who are out of work. They're either unemployed or underemployed, and that's, that's very concerning to us. So we have been working in developing innovative solutions to that, including a recent partnership that we've developed with the Veterans Affairs uh, Administration to uh, put CRNAs to work on a temporary basis who are, in, who are inclined to sign up for a four-week four, uh, yeah, four trial, or not trial, but four-week period of employment. Uh, we've had a pretty significant success with that, and we're looking at other opportunities as well. So uh, another thing that we, we released today, and this is really just a, we know that there's, there's so much going on. Uh, the last thing you want to do is think about CE, and, and the NBCRNA was gracious and had the foresight to delay the recertification cycle by four months for, for those of us who are scheduled to recertify on August 1st. Uh, but we have also made uh, continuing education free. Uh, for all of our members in the late uh, April to mid-July time frame, so you don't have to worry about that. So uh, that's just a high-level update. I know we'll get into some more here through the question and answer period, and I'll ask my colleague, Dr. Lorraine Jordan, uh, to take over from here. Thank you, Randy. Well, welcome to uh, our tell us town meeting this evening. For the next 40 minutes or so, we hope to address some of your major concerns and frequently asked questions regarding COVID-19. So let's start with Dr. Brett Morgan, AANA Senior Director of Practice and Education. But here's a question we received. My hospital is experiencing a shortage of essential PPE and providers are wanting to bring in their own. The hospital administration is opposed to this. What suggestions do you have to help CRNAs advocate for the appropriate PPE? Lorraine, that's a really great question and actually one that we're getting quite often. Um, the first thing I want everybody to know is, and probably the most important thing to remember, is that you are entitled to be safe. This means that you should be protected from exposure from COVID and your family should be protected from that and your facility should be providing you with that protection. But we know that in this current environment, with limited resources, limited PPE, the reality is many facilities are reluctant to adopt PPE policies that provide that high level of protection. The AANA was the first to recommend a high level protection based on the elevated risk of exposure that you as CRNAs face. We had to work hand in hand with other anesthesia stakeholders to eventually achieve a consensus on what has always been the safest for you. And we will continue to work to get more PPE and continue to work to make sure that our position on PPE is heard. We have also publicly supported the use of self-supplied PPE and will continue to do so, not because we want you to have to use it, but because we want you to be able to protect yourself if your employer is unable to. In fact, the ANA publicly supported the use of self-supplied PPE before the Joint Commission re recently released their statement and support and a full week before other anesthesia associations were willing to do so. I believe that if you take the information, uh, if you take the growing number of statements, including the AANA's position statement on this, the CDC even has developed recommendations that include the use of self-supplied PPE. And you take those recommendations to your hospital administration, you will have all the ammunition you need to be allowed to do what you think is best for your own good. Brett, here's another question. My governor has ordered all elective procedures to end. This has resulted in a loss of work for many CRNAs in my facility. As a result, hospital administration has asked anesthesia staff to cover other roles. What resources are available to CRNAs who are being asked to assume roles as APRNs outside of the OR or as ICU nurses? Wow, another great question. And probably the most common that we're getting right now. CRNAs are finding themselves in, in positions that uh, a month or so ago we never thought we would, but we're certainly well-trained to assume. 
uh, the ANA has worked hard with subject matter experts within our own profession. So CRNAs who are also nurse practitioners, acute care nurse practitioners with, with work experience in critical care areas to develop a robust um, collection of resources for you. You'll find them on our COVID website. Um, we also have recommendations for, for uh, or essentially a, a job description or a role description that you could take to hospital administration to help advocate for the correct use of, C of CRNAs in your facility. We really feel that CRNAs are advanced practice nurses and your skill set, therefore, is one that should be utilized by your facility to that level. Um, if you do find yourself working in, uh, in a situation where you're performing duties as a registered nurse, it's important to remember that you bring tremendous uh, skill and experience to that role. And again, we, we would hope that you would be advocating for yourself to be used in an advanced practice position. Uh, you'll also find um, resources recently placed on our website around billing and coding for critical care services. And I would encourage you to take those to hospital administrators or other key stakeholders in your facility as they start to develop these new roles for you. So here's a question we're seeing quite a bit uh, across the board in some of the literature. My facility is considering using anesthesia gas machines as ICU ventilators. What advice do you have? Well, this is really the reality in some of the places where CRNAs are working. We are hearing this, and unfortunately, I think it's likely to become uh, the reality in many more. Um, it's important to note that ventilators uh, that are part of anesthesia delivery systems are not ICU ventilators, but many now have functions that are very similar. Um, so it's important that you consult with the manufacturer of the machine. Um, you also can, um, I would encourage you to, to, to use the resources that on the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation's webpage, because I found that those provide some of the best resources available on this topic. Uh, one thing is clear though, Anesthesia professionals should be involved directly in the care that is given using an anesthesia gas machine. Um, on a similar topic though, I think we are closely monitoring trends around the use of one ventilator for more than one patient. And I know that wasn't exactly the, the, the question you asked me, but I think it's something that we do need to address tonight. Uh, most experts will agree that this is not advised and, and we have taken the stance at the AANA along with our colleagues at the ASA and the APSF that we that a ventilator should only be used for one patient. But that, that may be changing. Uh, just yesterday, the Surgeon General uh, recognized that this may become the reality. And so we're going to be following this really closely and working with our anesthesia colleagues because I feel like it's essential for us to have one voice on this issue. So here's one more question about drug shortages. I'm concerned about drug shortages and I'm wondering what should I be doing? So this is a, this is a really important question and something that's starting to become um, more and more concerning to me. Uh, we know that the demand for anesthesia drugs has increased. In fact, uh, some recent reports indicated that in March there was a 52% increase in the use of sedative agents roughly 60% increase in the use of opioids in our health system, health systems, and a nearly 40% rise in the use of muscle relaxants. That coupled with a supply chain disruption, because many of our drugs are imported from other countries like China, um, we are facing a significant drug shortage. The FDA is continuing to monitor this situation, and I would encourage anybody experiencing a drug shortage in their facility to report that drug shortage to drug, drug shortages at fda.hhs.gov. And of course, let me know, let us know at the ANA, because we will be working closely with others to address this issue in the coming days. Thank you, Brett. Thanks to both you and your team for providing us with some insight as it relates to some of the practice issues we're dealing with. Now I'd like to go ahead and move forward to ask Anna Poliak some questions. Anna is our Senior Director of State Government Affairs. Anna, here's a question. Has my state taken any action to remove restrictions on CRNA practice? Thanks, Lorraine, and uh, we've been getting quite a few of these questions. A number of states, governors have issued orders temporarily removing restrictions on CRNA practice 
as well as other orders concerning life insurance, CRNAs, and other providers. Among these states is Kentucky, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, New Jersey, New York, Tennessee, West Virginia, Wisconsin, and the situation is literally changing daily. So to keep everyone up to date with this, we have a list of states along with specific provisions of governor's orders pertaining to CRNA practice posted and regularly updated um, on the ANA coronavirus research page under the state government resources. Here's another question, Anna. What does the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services action to waive the requirement for supervision mean for my practice at the state level? Great question, Lorraine. As Randy alluded to earlier, uh, CMS recently removed uh, or waived the requirement for uh, physician supervision for CRNA. So CMS conditions of participation normally required that CRNA anesthesia services be under the supervision of a physician. The waiver temporarily removes this condition of participation, which is a federal requirement. State laws in place regarding supervision and other physician involvement will still remain in effect, meaning that CRNA services will still need to be under supervision of a physician. That being said, CRNAs in the states that do not have supervision requirement in state law will now be able to practice without physician supervision. So here's probably one of the more hot topics that we're starting to hear. And it has to do with telehealth. So the question to you, Anna, is what can CRNA do as it relates to telehealth? Yeah, it's a very interesting question and the one we've been getting um, a lot of. So unfortunately, I can't give you a precise answer because each state's laws and the governor's orders concerning telehealth vary. One general guideline is that telehealth services provided by any provider must be within state scope of practice for that particular provider. So ability to provide services via telehealth does not authorize scope of practice elements or prescriptive authority that are not already included in state scope of practice. So the rule of thumb would be that CRNAs in any given state considering providing telehealth services would still need to be practicing within the scope of practice that's outlined by their state law. Thanks, Anna, and thank you for your team for your hard work in helping our states through this crisis. Ralph, Absolutely. I think it's your turn. Ralph Cole is our Senior Director of Government Affairs. So Ralph, here's the question. What does removal of supervision really mean? Um, so it, great question, Dr. Jordan, and, and thank you. You know, I, I think this is a major step forward for uh, the association, the profession, and more importantly, the patients that we serve. Uh, removal of the Medicare Part A conditions of participation, supervision requirements are going to free up hospitals, free up uh, other facilities to utilize uh, CRNAs in the most efficacious way and cost effective way to meet the demands of the healthcare delivery system. Uh, during the crisis, uh, after we come out of this crisis, um, the need for a fully and efficiently, efficiently running uh, anesthesia workforce is going to be critical. Uh, this is the right policy three months ago, three years ago. It's the right policy today, and it will continue to be the right policy uh, after we come out of this crisis and the backlog of elective surgeries come to bear on the delivery system. Um, so this temporary removal allows CRNAs to work uh, under the Medicare program without any physician supervision for anesthesia and related services. So it's a major, major step forward uh, in the ability of facilities to utilize their existing uh, anesthesia workforce in, in the most efficient way possible and allows them to utilize CRNAs in all the ways that were educated, trained, and able to help uh, during this most trying time. So thank you for that question. So Ralph, we know that DC is a little bit chaotic right now a lot going on. What are our top priorities and how have we decided what those priorities are based on the current crisis? Yeah, uh, Lorraine, and, and thank you for another great question. You know, a, a lot goes into our, our thought processes before we decide on a legislative strategy and this crisis was no different. Uh, we have been reaching out to uh, CRNAs across the country, experts, business owners, people work in facilities, ambulatory surgical centers to see you know, what they need and why, what's the top priority. So 
uh, as we've been dealing with this crisis, we've identified kind of a two-pronged approach. Uh, the first, focusing on removal of barriers. Uh, we think that um, the, the crisis that we're involved in now is going to require um, every skilled and capable practitioner to practice to the top of their education and skill set to truly meet the challenges that we face now. Um, so uh, we are focusing on uh, removing uh, any and all barriers. So the Medicare Part A supervision, uh, we will continue to work to make that, uh, that barrier removal permanent um, throughout this process. And as we look at the COVID-4, you know, we've realized that, that our members have been dramatically affected um, by this crisis and the cancellation of elective surgeries around the country. So we're going to be focused uh, very, very hard on um, financial protections for our members. And uh, we have a number of provisions that we are currently pushing with members of Congress to keep every CRNA out there financially sound uh, throughout their, this disruption in their employment. Um, so we are currently working with legislative champions on a grant program uh, and grant funding. Uh, that would be, uh, the eligibility would be only for healthcare providers and CRNAs would be included in there. Um, and we're looking at a proposal that would uh, provide grants to those healthcare providers whose employment was disrupted uh, by this crisis. And, um, you know, we've, we've garnered champions that are, are willing and pushing for uh, provision in the COVID-4 package that would uh, give grants to these providers at 90% of uh, their, um, their salaries at the time of their employment disruption. Um, so we think that will be uh, a great way for uh, CRNAs who are currently out of work to remain whole throughout this crisis. We're also working on other provisions uh, related to employment status, um, specifically focused on uh, incentivizing businesses, facilities, business owners to rehire um, those who have been furloughed, laid off uh, during this crisis uh, at their contractual level uh, when their employment was disrupted. Um, so those are, you know, keeping CRNAs financially sound throughout this, uh, keeping them whole uh, is our focus. Uh, removing barriers uh, is our other primary focus um, to ensure that every American now and in the future has access to the highest quality health care and, and CRNAs are part of that solution. Thanks, Ralph. So I've got one question that's kind of, we wondered about. So how does the Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, affect our federal legislative priorities? Um, so the Surgeon General is an anesthesiologist and he's a, he's a capable guy. Um, I think he has a point of view as an anesthesiologist, uh, but we, that does not change what we're trying to accomplish. We remain focused on pushing forward an agenda that we believe to be the right agenda, uh, the, the agenda that's built based in evidence and economics, the one is, that's going to be the best for the future viability of healthcare delivery system. You know, I, I, and we're not gonna let uh, a high place anesthesiologist or anyone else uh, deter us from what we're trying to accomplish. And I think when, when we're uh, given the opportunity to uh, present our point of view uh, it's making sense. It's resonating throughout the halls of Congress. It's resonating throughout the administration, as we can see by the executive order removing supervision, um, several actions taken by Congress. Our message is getting across and uh, no one, quite frankly, is, is going to be able to stop our message from being heard because uh, we're going to make sure that, that it is. Um, so, uh, you know, I think um, we just have to continue relying on facts and evidence and uh, the compelling arguments that the CRNAs play in addressing a crisis and in addressing uh, the future uh, efficacy of our healthcare delivery system. I think that's always going to resonate with people. Um, and we're, we're, you know, every independent arbiter that we talk to from the think tanks um, throughout Washington, DC, um, you know, they all come down to the same conclusion when presented with the facts is that CRNAs are, are the solution. They're the solution to the three main um, goals of meaningful healthcare delivery system reform, access, cost, quality. You know, if you follow the evidence, you follow the economics, you focus on access, cost, and quality, you come to us and that's never going to change. And we're going to make sure that the right decision makers uh, hear that message loud and clear. Thanks so much, Ralph. And thank you so much for your team and the hard work that you've been 
able to do and accomplish a lot in DC, especially moving our federal agenda forward. So we've talked a little bit about practice. We've talked about state government affairs and we've talked about federal government affairs, but what about our CRNA's wellness? Having to deal with the current crisis and be effective. And what is AANA able to do for our CRNAs out there facing very treacherous conditions? So we've asked Julie Rice to join us, Manager of Health and Wellness. So Julie, I have a question for you. Where would we find resources to support mental health issues during this very traumatic time? Hi, Lorraine, thank you, and hello, everyone. Um, we have just this past week built a new webpage, and you'll find it amongst all the other COVID-19 resources. It's called COVID-19 Wellbeing. And it features specific um, stress and wellness resources specific to this coronavirus. So I would encourage everyone to take a moment and visit those pages. And it's important to recognize when you're stressed. It's really important to recognize that and do what you can in between working or in between not working, whatever, whatever your case is right now, to take care of yourself and take care of others too. Um, among those resources, like I said, are ways to recognize the stress and also ways to mitigate the stress. And if you are in the midst of it or whether you anticipate it coming on, it's good to find that work-life balance. Um, this is unprecedented in many ways because so many people, I mean, it's, we're seeing it moving across the country and the numbers are changing, but what is common in everybody is the stress. And so reach out to your colleagues, reach out to your peers as you can, because nobody else knows. No one else knows what that experience and the feelings are. So within the resources on the page, like I said, it's, it's COVID wellness. Uh, actually, you find it at ana.com slash COVID wellness, or else just through the links on the main COVID page. But one of the things we've got is conversation tips to help a colleague and help help them if they're feeling stressed and, and be a good listener. Um, I think that's, that's most of it. Yeah, tips. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, running on. <laughs> so, Julie, that's great, but how do I know when I'm too stressed or when I, I need help? What are my indicators? Well, it, it, as everybody knows, there's a normal level of stress, which helps you rise to the occasion when, say, you're overburdened at work. Uh, but you it, to recognize that it's gone beyond normal, and that's when it starts um, affecting your ability to function in your day-to-day -day life. And at that point in time, when you really have got it's lasted too long or affected your your general status enough, then it's time to seek professional counseling. And actually, that's something you could do preemptively, too. There are a lot of telehealth resources, teletherapy resources out there. So you might even want to anticipate that it is going to be an issue and to prepare yourself. Um, your workplace might have an EAP. You could find a healthcare professional or um, a, a counselor through that, and we recommend everyone just kind of ready themselves by looking at the resources. Julie, thank you so much for your time this evening and the advice you've given us. The one thing I would say is take a moment and reach out to your colleagues. We all need a pat on the back, and today, especially those CRNAs at the, in the front lines, and you know who you are, and many of you know many, many who are there and need help. Just those signs of encouragement and just saying that we know what you're doing and we support you is critical. So let's move on. Let's ask John Fetcho to weigh in here. John is the director of AANA Insurance, Insurance Services. So John, I've got a question for you. Elective surgeries have been discontinued in my state, but my MDA or my MD boss continues asks me to do them and expects me to provide anesthesia services for these procedures. Am I putting myself at risk for either an insurance or a liability standpoint? Can you help us out? Good evening, Lorraine. Uh, thank you for that question. We're actually hearing from a lot of our members uh, that they're being asked to uh, continue to provide anesthesia for procedures that probably fall in the elective category. Um, you aren't the one making the decision whether or not to do that procedure. So regardless of who your insurance company is, whether it's a NA Insurance Services or another insurance company, 
you can be pretty confident that your insurance will cover you, even though you may be doing an elective procedure when, you know, your state is, is, is forbidding those. Because at the end of the day, it's really the, the physician who's making that decision. But I will tell you that you are increasing your potential liability in those situations. You know, if, if there ends up being an adverse patient outcome in a normal situation, if you as a CRNA neither caused nor contributed to the patient's adverse outcome, you'll, you'll eventually be dismissed from that suit. But if there ends up being an adverse patient outcome in a situation where you've provided an anesthetic in uh, one of these situations where, you know, it really was an elective situation, more than likely you are gonna get drawn into that claim and you know, there is gonna be some liability on your part. Um, again, your insurance will be, will be there to protect you, but going forward, you could run into a problem where you may have to pay more for your insurance or it may be more challenging to get insurance. So you do, you do put yourself at a greater risk if you do an anesthetic for a procedure that is an elective surgery if you're not supposed to be doing that. I've got another question for you, John. So I'm a CRNA and now I've been asked to work in the ICU. Will my insurance cover me working in the ICU? Lorraine, that's gonna be dependent upon your insurance company. As an example, uh, ANA Insurance Services represents a company by the name of Medical Protective. And a few years ago, we <laughs> added an endorsement to our policy that allows our members to work not only as registered nurse anesthetists, but also as registered nurses. Uh, we saw a number of our members who had the opportunity to do things outside of strictly the anesthesia arena, uh, Botox being an example, or working uh, uh, with ketamine for depression. So we wanted to make sure that our members could, could work in any sort of uh, practice setting that fell within their licensure and scope of practice. So our policies do, in fact, allow our members to work um, to the full scope of practice as both a, as a nurse anesthetist and as a registered nurse. But again, that's going to be really dependent upon uh, who your insurance company is. And I would say in the vast majority of cases, you probably don't have coverage under your policy if it's not through ANA Insurance Services. Thanks, John. That was very enlightening. Now, one more question. I have an opportunity to work in another state. Will my malpractice insurance cover me in other states? Again, Lorraine, it's gonna be dependent upon uh, the insurance company that you work with. Uh, as an example, with our insurance company, Medical Protective, there are no restrictions whatsoever on the state that you may work in. So if you uh, work in Alabama, let's say, and I know, um, you know, the uh, requirements related to uh, licensing have changed and you might have the opportunity to go and work in New York. As a matter of fact, we're hearing from a lot of CRNAs who are um, going to New York to work, but they aren't going to be working as, again, they aren't going to be working as, as, as CRNAs. Uh, again, uh, you need to check with your insurance company to find out what your scope of practice is allowable under your policy and if you can work in multiple states. But if you have a policy through ANA Insurance Services, you'd be covered. I, I do wanna point out that ANA Insurance Services is here as a resource to all members. You don't have to buy a policy from us to call us uh, and to get you know, information or resources, or hopefully we can point you in the right direction. You know, we might know more about you know, your insurance company than, than, than you do, and so we're happy to help in any way we can. So you don't have to buy, buy anything from us. We're here as a resource. So if you have questions about malpractice, you know, give us a call. We may not know the answer, but we'll help you find it. John, thanks so much to both you and your team at AA and a Insurance. We really appreciate you taking some time this evening to answer some critical questions. And thank you for everybody on the panel who's taken the time to uh, help provide additional information for our members on this very and during this very critical situation. 
I do have one announcement. The AANA, uh, we've recently sent out a survey because we really need to know from you how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting you. Please complete that survey. There are questions about member employment and then clinical challenges. We really, really need your input so we can better understand and appreciate and serve you, the members, through this very critical time. So Kate, I believe I'll turn the meeting over to you. Thank you, Lorraine. I know many of you are experiencing unique situations which none of us have seen before. This is history in the making. Many of the things you've seen unfold are very moving and heartwarming. There are CRNAs doing outstanding things every day during this crisis. It's part of our jobs, and in many cases, beyond what we thought our jobs would be. We'd like to document your experience, the good, the bad, the happy, and the sad. As you know, there's a new edition of Watchful Care coming out next year. We'd like you to be part of it, and other accounts of this period that will be made during our history. If you're willing to share your stories with ANA, I invite you to email them to pr at ana.com. Photos as well. On behalf of the ANA Board of Directors and staff, we are profoundly grateful for the sacrifices CRNAs are making to serve on the front lines during this pandemic. It is because of you that we are able to help combat this virus and save lives. Thank you to everyone for joining us tonight.